Welcome everybody to the first like real, real, real session of MCN 2012. So um, thanks to Ed Raleigh for um, making me do this. Um, <laughs> um, so what we're talking about here is really, as, as it says there, um, blogging as a personal and professional development practice. So, um, you know, I think what we've all found over the last several years is, you know, us as a community, we used to only exist in these moments like right here where we were all together in one room. And then over time, um, we started to see blogging sort of take the place of that in a year-round fashion as a, as a platform to keep these sorts of conversations going continually throughout the year. And despite uh, uh, the constant declarations that blogging is over and dead and is going to be replaced by this platform and that platform, um, it hasn't happened, and in fact, it seems like it's stronger than ever. And certainly in our community, it's vitally important. And so um, here we have four uh, representatives of all different types of approaches to blogging. Institutional blogs, professional blogs, blogs that sort of straddle the line between those things, and, and Sue's. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we've got uh, Suze Cairns, uh, PhD candidate from the University of Newcastle, um, Ed Rodley, senior exhibit developer at uh, the Museum of Science in Boston, uh, Eric Siegel from the New York Hall of Science, and Mike Morosky uh, from the Portland Art Museum. So um, welcome, everybody. Um, and just a reminder, um, use this hashtag if you're tweeting anything. I'll be watching it throughout the session. And if you want to submit questions or anything <coughs> like that, feel free to do it there. Thanks. Um, so without further ado, let me just talk a little bit about what we were hoping the format would be. Um, we don't want to spend a lot of time making you look at slides. Uh, so in, in fact, aside from my very short presentation, we're just going to try to talk a little bit about what we have encountered in terms of our own experience as museum bloggers and really uh, try to spend as much of the session as possible talking with you because we could talk amongst ourselves and do anyway. Um, what we're most interested in is hearing what, you, what questions you have, what ex your experiences have been. Um, so, by all means, um, if there's anything that, that comes up during any one of our talks that you want to make sure that Coven gets a chance to look at, um, he is kindly going to try to moderate the conversation at the, <clears throat> at the end of our presentations. Um, so without further ado, um, what does it mean for me to be a museum blogger? <laughs> right. You are using my student laptop, it's had a hard life, it's pretty slow. So just just forgive it. Oh boy, yeah, maybe we will just bail on this thing. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Please respond. We're all gonna blog about this. There thing. we go. Okay, okay. so <laughs> is this um, a computer conference? <laughs> it, it, it is a museum technology conference, therefore we are doomed. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, the blog that that I maintain is actually my personal blog that it has no um, institutional affiliation, though it all I really talk about are professional issues, um, which is um, <coughs> which is a reaction to particular circumstances at my place of employment, which I'll, I'll be happy to talk about later. Um, but it's it's interesting that you wind up managing different kinds of personae. So I have an online persona now that I never had before I started blogging, which is slightly different than my real world physical persona. Um, and being able to manage those and remembering who you are when you're talking in different media has become sort of an issue that was not something I expected when I started. Um, when I first started blogging, I thought it was just a notebook. Um, I, I, I originally started a blog as a result of uh, reorganization at the museum with massive layoffs and I was, I was witnessing a lot of institutional knowledge go away and I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna use this thing that is not on my work machine as a place to uh, write down things that I thought were important about exhibit development at the time. So I had a very narrow, practical focus. Um, and that really didn't work out terribly well. Uh, in fact, my blog just sort of sat around for about a year when I would occasionally go look at it and write down things that were of interest really only to me. Um, so I was very bad at it for the first year or so. Um, and then one day, something interesting happened. Um, a friend of mine was in town and said, hey, Ed, we're going to go see a couple of art exhibits um, this afternoon. Do you want to come with us? I said, sure. I didn't really have much, uh, much in terms of expectations, but we went to see two of the most uh, mind-blowing exhibits I've seen in probably the last decade. So we went to the De Cordova Museum and took Halsey Bergen's um, Scapes Interactive, which is this 
um, generative music piece, participatory audio exploration of a sculpture park and garden that just like literally completely kicked my ass. Um, that two hours later, I, I was still like, I can't believe this is actually as powerful as it is. Um, and then immediately following that up, we went to the Peabody Essex Museum. I only have a very crappy cell phone picture. Uh, but we saw Charles Sanderson's installation in East India Marine Hall. So this is a 1797 uh, building that is sort of your archetypal old museum. Pictures stacked four or five rows high, gigantic cabinets full of random stuff. Um, and what Sanderson did was set up a bunch of projectors... Um, and basically perform this video piece in the space without touching anything. So without doing anything to the original room, he completely transformed it um, with these displays of uh, pixels tracing, the inter interplay of ideas, passing back and forth, themes of maritime trade. Um, the projections would actually wrap around all six surfaces, so floor, ceiling, walls. They would go around the picture frame. Sometimes they would fill up a picture and expose the portrait inside it. Um, just completely mind-boggling, especially in a space that traditional, to see something that incredible happening. And uh, by the end of the day, I was like, I have to tell somebody about these things. And I had no vehicle to do that other than to go back to work and say, you guys got to go see these things, which seemed like a very inadequate response. Um, so I thought, oh, I've got that, that blog sitting around. Um, I'll go tell people, because I finally had something that I was of interest to more than just me. Um, and interestingly enough, um, you know, once you start sharing your ideas with people, um, they oftentimes want to talk to you about them. Um, so instead of just it being a broadcast medium, I, it seems kind of dumb now, but I didn't really think of it as, as a conversation. Um, you know, people immediately had concerns. They had clarifications they wanted. Um, you know, they wanted to know more about this, more about that. Have you seen this? Have you done that? Um, and very soon, I was sort of hooked because, as Coven said, um, blogging is often a way to explore ideas that are interesting to you and not just to you, but to interested colleagues. It was sort of the best of the conference experience um, when you can actually sit around with people and hash out these important ideas. And it's a pretty high-value communication. Uh, there's, the signal-to-noise ratio is pretty good. Um, you know, we, we are a very niche community. It's not the kind of thing that is ever going to, you know, rise to the top of the, the screen in Reddit. Um, so you can pretty much guarantee that you're going to... People who are going to come are going to have interesting things to say to you. All right. So what are things I've noticed? Uh, blogging, duh, is incredibly fast. Um, I submitted an article to Curator that just came out this month. So that's the October 2012 issue of Curator. I wrote it in April of 2011. Uh, right, it went through one complete rewrite after the editorial board uh, said, you know, this is, oh, this is lovely. Can you change this, 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 and basically completely redo the article? Um, <laughs> in that same time period, I've written, I think, 70 blog posts when the word count would probably be the equivalent of like 15 of those articles. Um, and the majority of them have at least as much content. They might not be as, as uh, obsessively annotated as, as a curator article, but in terms of the actual depth of research and thinking that went into them, it's, they're pretty comparable. Um, so your ability to have, uh, to have <coughs> quality and quantity is sort of amazing. Um, People are actually out there listening, um, which is one of the big things that is winds up being a problem, because if you say something, you can never take it back, uh, which is something I think everybody else will probably be able to talk about. Um, you know, even if you delete it immediately and go, oh, shit, that was a mistake. Um, you know, it's already been sent to people who have subscribed to your blog. You'll never be able to take all of the copies back, and that's something that can be quite daunting. Um, and also, when you talk about other people's work, they want to actually respond to you. Um, so this, this summer I went to Australia and I spent a lot of time seeing some really cool museums, particularly the Museum of Old and New Art in Hobart, which if you are within 3,000 miles, you should totally go to see. Um, so I wrote this long, long review of it. Um, and, you know, people started commenting and one day I came in and um, I saw on the top of my comment queue, oh, the director of the museum has left a long, long comment. And, you know, it was a couple of hours before I could actually work up the gumption to actually go read what his comment was, because <laughs> it hadn't really dawned on me to the extent that, um, you know, I've written lots of reviews of different things and spouted off my opinion, um, and to actually have someone who, whose life work I had 
basically spent you know several paragraphs summing up response to me was uh, really reminded me of the uh, it's very easy to be blase and to just you know say things quickly but the the real world implications of everything you say in a blog um, reach much further than that luckily David had nothing nothing terribly bad to say aside from correcting a few obvious mistakes I made um, but ever since then um, you know anytime I hit the publish button there is always that momentary pause of should I read this one more time? Uh, and the answer is usually yes. Um, so, um, what is the biggest challenge of anybody, I think, who's blogging professionally is to feel that fear, but do it anyway. Um, it is not a bad thing that it feels sort of terrifying and daunting. Um, and if I had to describe blogging in one word, I would certainly say it's terrifying. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> blogging has connected me to tons of people I never would have met otherwise. So here's, here's a, a visualization of my LinkedIn network. And everybody in the blue are, are people who I know from work. Uh, and everybody else on the other side, all the pink and the orange, and aside from the outliers on the bottom who are like my family, um, those are all people I've met online. Um, you know, it is, it is essentially half of my professional network I owe to being out there online. Um, so there is some overlap, obviously, between them. But in terms of you know, your own practice and trying to figure out what's going on in the world, who are the people I want to know, who are the people who are doing work that is interesting to me, there is no substitute for it. Um, coming to conferences comes close, but, you know, how many of us can go to more than one or two conferences a year? All right, so things I have particularly learned being a non-institutional professional blogger, um, it could be kind of tricky. I never asked permission of my institution because I knew that they would say no um, at the time. They were, they were coming up with all kinds of, um, they were talking about lots of policies, like having an intellectual property policy and a social media policy and this policy and that policy. And I, I made the decision that I was just going to do it and not wait for them. Um, and if I ever get in trouble for it, then I will, you know, I'll beg for forgiveness and hope they don't fire me. Um, but that makes it, you know, you, that makes what I can say and not say a little bit different. I try very hard to um, disassociate my professional persona from my work persona, so I very infrequently comment about things that are going on um, at work to the extent when I first started blogging somebody said who the hell are you and where do you work because I can't even figure <laughs> out who you are uh, how do I know I should listen to you and I had to go back and add a little bit more biographical information just so people could have a sense of um, why, should, why should anybody listen to what you have to say um, interestingly um, for these kind of blogs this is a, a, a word cloud of my blog um, it's still pretty content driven. Um, you know, most of these things are nouns, um, which people seem to like. Everybody seems to like reports from the field, what's going on. So I went back and did a lot of crunching of numbers, and my top five posts are all reviews. So things that I have seen that other people may not have seen and are interested in. Um, far and away, everything else out of the 130 odd posts on that blog are way, way, way below these. Um, all right, last but not least, um, I thought it would just be interesting to talk a little bit about what the audience is, because one of the big questions that I always run into in blogging is, well, it's just the same people talking to each other, right? It's you and Seb Chan and Suze <laughs> and, like, three other people all commenting on each other's blogs, and everybody talks to Nina, and Nina talks back to them. Um, and the reality is that it's not, it, that is not true, um, and I, I did not realize that until I went and actually crunched some of the numbers. So here are, here are the top ten countries of people who are reading my blog, and not surprisingly, US, Australia, and UK. Um, I've, I've wound up writing about a lot about Australian stuff in the last year because they're doing so much interesting work, which is sort of interesting. But you know, when you get down to the bottom, the other top 10, New Zealand, Sweden, Italy, I don't know anybody there. Um, they're, not, they're not tightly connected to my professional network, but they are out there. Um, if you look at the top 10 refers, search engines, four times more hits come to the site from search <coughs> engines than from anything else. So it's not the same people. It's people who are out there on the web looking for content, and they are driven to the site because I said something about some particular topic they were interested in. Um, so that's like, uh, I think it was like 4,000 refers, and the next closest one is Twitter at like maybe 1,000, and then everything else is triple digits or uh, double digits. So it's not just the same people. Um, but... One thing that is uh, something I keep running into is this whole whole notion of um, blogging for me is a means to an end. 
uh, but it's very easy to lose sight of that and just have blogging be the thing you do. Um, and it's sort of seductive. You know, people say things they they want to talk to you, they want to hear what you have to say, and if if you don't stay focused on what the goal is. And for me, this is really a professional development practice. I want to know who's out there doing things. I want to know what their work is. I want to be able to connect with them, trade ideas with them, work with them. Um, it's very easy to just get stuck in, in the doing of the thing that is the means to the end. So stop looking at your stats and get back to work. It's really the short form of this. Um, so last but not least, that's really why I blog. It makes me do my thinking properly. If you're actually going to be out there and be transparent in your practice, here's what I'm thinking of. Here are the issues I'm worrying about. Here are the questions I have. Um, having to write it down, knowing that people are going to say, you know, going to see it and respond to it, and you're never going to be able to take it back, makes it very, very easy for me, at least, to do my thinking properly and not just say something off the cuff. Although I have done that in the past, <laughs> and it usually comes back to bite you. So that's why I blog. Next. <laughs> Mike? Am I up next? Ooh, one up. I don't have any PowerPoint slides prepared, so yeah, um, this will be. That's okay. This will be, so he just ruined mine. No, just kidding. Uh, yeah, this will be a little more. My laptop means it's going to be five minutes before it's going It warms again. back up again. No, they no, start no, no, running no, no, on no, their no. wheel. And, um, yeah. So I think maybe what I've done is actually logged into my site from the admin side. And, you know, I, this is a great conference because it's all about openness. And so just lay, you know, I don't really care. Just lay it all out there. Everybody who's a co author on my blog. Um, and I'll sort of tell where it came from, but um, has access to sort of see stats, hits, refers, all that stuff, which I think is really nice because it makes it a group authority type of a thing. So the site is artmuseumteaching.com, and it started and officially, like, like it's publicly launched in February of this year, so it's also pretty new. Um, where did it, I'll, I'll sort of give a little bit of where it came from, why I started it, what it is, and then we'll take a look at some things that Ed made me want to look at and, and sort of show, although I don't spend a ton of time looking at it. I'm very interested in who reads it, how did they get to it, sort of the ethnography of where these paths go and come from. <clears throat> and then I just had some, some questions or things that fascinate me about blogging and mm -hmm. made me really interested in coming together with people that now I know are real people and not just people I met online. Um, Ed, none of these people have I ever met before in person, so now I know they're real people. <laughs> um, Which so, is an MCN trope. Yeah. <laughs> really. Like, and oh. it's happening in the audience, too. I'm like, I think I recognize that little Twitter icon sitting yeah. out there. <clears throat> so the, the site... I've been a museum educator for about seven or eight years, went to dozens of conferences, and dozens of times experienced where I go to a conference like this, have incredible conversations. We're going to continue these conversations. This is great. I want to know what you're doing. And that was an awesome project. And you asked me a really good question. Let's continue this conversation. <laughs> you know? We get back to our offices and we're like, oh, I've got this grant due tomorrow and this new exhibition is opening and uh, coming from the education side, we've just school tours and docents and never happens or sometimes rarely happens. A telephone conference call might get connected six months later and then the next conference happens and we all get connected in this great conversations and then pff, nothing happens. So I kept wanting to do something online to get people to be able to Bring, keep that going. So if you presented something awesome at a conference, bring it online. Let's have comments. Let's have conversation about it. Um, I did it as a private blog at first to kind of get some content laid out and had people invited to it. <clears throat> and then in February had about 12 posts or something, so I just laid it out there and um, opened the call for authors. Anybody within anything connected to art museum education, um, Write something. Tell us what you're doing. It can be draft. It doesn't have to be a formal article type of thing. Just a couple images, cool pictures of practice is what I like to call it. There's a section called Spotlights on Practice, which is where it really all started. So um, so we, we started doing that. It's got 14 authors now, um, including myself. And I post probably once every five or six posts. Um, just Usually it's just to keep it going. Uh, try to post it about once every week and a half is about where we're at now. Um, oh, now I don't know where. Oh, Renaissance Hotel. Okay. It doesn't like it anymore, so. That's the wrong network she's on. Well, maybe we'll just stay here and I won't click go. on it. <laughs> I'll play. You talk. Okay, so um, 
there, and the authors are from three countries now, which I really like. We've got uh, Mexico, the United States, and Australia um, participating, um, which is exciting. All kinds of different museums, um, not all art museum people, but some people reflecting on issues that connect across all museums. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to mention is that, because it came up in our early conversations before kind of this formal presentation side, was uh, I really think when I started it out, I wanted it to be most conversation, less posting, less of this, look what I did, I'm so great, I'm going to post like the final results of this awesome project, but more of a, hey, I'm thinking about doing this, or I did it in a tiny way yesterday, I'm going to post about it, and I'm going to try to get as many comments and conversation and feedback as I can. Um, right now, the site is at about... 25% posting and 75% commenting, which is somewhere around where I wanted it to be. If it gets to more posting and less commenting, then I'll totally reflect on what it is. Um, I used to call it, I think on the site, it's called a forum for reflecting on practice. Um, after last night's Ignite session, I want to call it a bazaar um, for reflecting. On, I like that a lot better than for reflecting on practice. Um, I've actually hesitated calling it a blog because I think when people call it a blog, it means something different, but I'd but some people have a negative connotation to a blog, and I want to erase that, so I still call it a blog because it's basically a group blog. Um, so I want, if I, do you think it'll work if I click on something? Or <laughs> I will think the, we're doomed. Okay, well, I won't touch anything. Um, so um, I'll mention just three quick things, but I think what I'll do is probably mention them really briefly, and then hopefully what we'll do is get into a conversation because that's what I'm kind of prepared for is conversation style 25, stuff. 75. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we should have 75% conversation. Um, so thing one was, who looks at this stuff? And not in the sense of, you know, a certain number of hits means it's good and a certain number of hits means it's bad, but it's just so cool to see how much outreach impact, I, I'd rather call it clickership than readership, because it's so hard to know, is that 5,000 people? Or somebody click, and then they you know, go somewhere else, and they click, and they're clicking around the site. So I just call it clickership. Um, <clears throat> it's actually pretty phenomenal that in meeting bloggers here today, in the last couple of years, I would say that museum blogs alone reach a few million people, a, year, a few million clickers a year. Um, that's phenomenal. That's incredible outreach um, and communication and audience and publicness to it. Um, so I'm really interested in kind of that. And when you post a blog and it gets picked up on Pinterest, on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on you know the list, there's like 365 different or more than that of these the different social media networks that things get picked up on. Um, and then someone re re Instagram something onto Twitter, and I love that web of complexity where it gets commented on. Um, you know, New York Times or Elle, we just did a, a post on teen engagement in museums. That's now the number one post for the entire site, and I uh, got picked. LA Youth was connecting to it, and there was another blog. There've been three more blogs writing about it and connecting back. So that graphic that Ed showed about his LinkedIn network is this really awesome, like three dimensional web that Curtis Wong could probably lay out in a worldwide <laughs> telescope <laughs> and show us a real time of how these things explode like an earthquake. Because I think it's um, it's really organic. And, and that's what it's interesting to see how that all works. Um, I had a similar experience to Ed when, in terms of the publicness of it. So the biggest bump to the site, um, in terms of just people knowing about it, happened when the Getty laid off their educate most of their much of their education department, um, and I got. With, there was no conference happening, and I got phone calls with tons of colleagues, whether they were at the Getty, whether they were at museums across the country, and we said, this is awful for our field, but someone's got to say something about this. We've got to have a conversation about this. We can't just have, well, I called this person because I'm a, in a clique and I know this person, but let's lay it all out on the table and talk about this. So I said, I'm just going to do it. And if I get fired, my wife will forgive me at some point. <laughs> um, so did it in a respectful, thoughtful way. After the National Art Education Association had formally responded, um, I picked that up, wrote something, had a colleague who used to work for the Getty uh, write a post that was really soul-searching about it. Um, Jim Cuno responded, and I'm, like, driving in the car. It's like, you have one comment. So I'm like, oh, I wonder who this is. Jim Cuno, the you know the CEO of the Getty who just laid off his staff, and I'm saying, you shouldn't have done that. Um, and it, well, now it's just really mad at us. So, just, just, <laughs> so it's interesting, the sort of publicness of those sites. Uh, and that, that, had, that post had, at the time, the most comment, that post had the most comments of any of them until this teen engagement one. 
one recently, um, which has opened up a really great conversation about the fact that museums kind of do suck sometimes when it comes to teen engagement. And it's nice to say we don't suck, but then to have people say, no, we do suck, um, and to have that productive conversation um, a little bit uh, on, in this bazaar. Um, one other thing about publicness, and then actually the rest of my comments are very fast. Um, I'm really interested in what these sites, and Ed mentioned the curator article submission. I'm really interested in what these sites do. Not that I have anything against Curator. Curator is a great journal. But it's a great example of how different this is if you consider it online publishing versus, I don't know that there's a, not versus, but in in addition to blogging about something. Um, So I'm interested in it. The the journal that I think most of my colleagues uh, still publish in is the Journal of Museum Education. So we did a test post with an issue, two uh, two of the co-editors of an issue posted about the issue, and they made some links to the site and to one of the articles that was the only one available online. And I wanted to see how many people connected through it through the blog versus subscribers reading the print thing. Um, I think the last time I checked, four times the number of people were viewing it through the blog and clicking on the article, then read it in paper version, sort of subscriptions or libraries or those things. Um, And that's only within a handful of months, maybe three or four months. So that will continue to grow. And so it's interesting to see that blogs are immediate. You can get your ideas out there right away, especially the Getty thing. You know, That's actually the example. Someone wanted to publish an article about the professional practice of museum education and what that laying off meant for it. Well, it would be published next year. And we've already passed that by. It'd be like publishing something about Hurricane <coughs> Sandy and its impact on museums two years from now. You know, our memories are, you know, Mm -hmm. not going to, oh, yeah, that's an urgent moment thing. Um, The teen engagement thing, too, I think it's a great issue, but we had this great teenager writing a piece in L.A. Youth about museums suck and why they do. And it was a great moment to say, let's write something about this and get a conversation now, not in Curator or Journal of Museum Education three years from now. Um, So I'm not saying one is good or bad, just I'm really interested in what these sites can do for an immediate conversation about practice that I think is really productive. Two more things and then I'll shut up. (laughs) One, I love the community building around these sites. um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I like the sort of groupness of my site. uh, Or I hate my site, our site. Um, I'm interested in how these uh, blogs build communities of practice. And again, back to Ed's visual, I'm glad he he sort of shared that because I think there's an incredible um, ability for these sites to create communities of practice and conversations. Um, I'm presenting with other people from other platforms at the National Art Education Association next year on how that impacts professionals and in the art museum education field. Um, And then lastly, how well do we play with others as bloggers? As a parent of a three-year-old, I always think, how do we play with others? Um, Do we steal things and not give other people our toys? Um, How do we play? And I'll just ask questions. Um, How well do we as bloggers, as digital authors, play well across national and cultural boundaries? How global are these conversations? Um, Or how global aren't they sometimes? Mm. Um, I've tried to work on that, but it's just really hard sometimes. Um, And you you can sort of see people are viewing these sites from all over the world. How do we play across fields, um, types of museums? How do we get science museums, non-museum professional, you know, emerging professionals that aren't with an institution currently to all be talking together? Um, even though uh, history museums may be more boring, as was mentioned last night, how do we get them involved in the conversation about these things online? Um, and even people from schools, superintendents, formal schooling, how did they get connected to this? Um, how do we connect these existing forums for online interaction? So how can we connect blogs to all the other social media networks that you're connected to and bring them all together? How do we connect Google Hangouts and Blog Talk Radio and all of that to these sites? Um, If I had a sabbatical, I could probably work more on it. But part of the problem of being uh, a full-time employee of a museum while doing this is that you don't have time to do a lot of that. Um, and then how do, how do bloggers work together, big and small? So if you have a blog and you don't care how many people read it, but maybe it's a couple dozen, how does a Nina Simon work with you? How does the, there's a, a blog in Portland, Oregon, which is where I'm currently at, that gets a million and a quarter visitors a year. How does he not get off his you know, high and mighty blog stool and work with a blogger that's just starting out, maybe a teen blogger or something like that, um, which I think is extremely valuable. Um, okay, so just questions, and I'm going to end there. Okay. Um, so it's, it's really interesting hearing from both of these guys because 
they've both sort of spoken about they had a plan with their blog they had something they wanted to achieve I kind of kamikaze in so um, I only knew that museum tech was a thing because somehow I stumbled, stumbled upon Seb Chan's blog this was many years ago I just come out of uh, I've been working in the music industry and I ended up in a dead-end ad admin job that I knew I wasn't going to continue in, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I don't know how I stumbled across Seb's blog. I, it just happened, and I kept going back to it. I'd done a fine art degree, and, you know, it just seemed interesting. So I ended up uh, going to my local art gallery. This was I was in a desperate plea to try and find some work in the creative sector and saying, hey, look at what the powerhouse does, and you guys have no internet presence, why, why aren't you online? You know, this is an institution that had, at that stage, about nine and a half staff versus the powerhouse with their, you know, 250 or so staff. You know, it, the, the scale, the possibility, I, I had no context for that. Um, so going in and saying, why aren't you doing this? I actually got an in, so I started volunteering with them and we started looking at how we could come up with policies to get social media, like Facebooking, uh, Facebook and those sorts of things. We sit under a city council and so we needed to work with council because council had never done any of these things. And then right about that time they happened to get a grant to get a website and I actually got a job helping oversee the redevelopment of the website. So I never had a tech background. I had had nothing to do with the internet at this point, with the exception that I'd found Seb's blog and found it really, really interesting. And so I took it to my art museum and that's sort of how this started. So me being in this sector at all was because of a blog. Um, so last year, um, I decided to apply for museums in the web. I had just done an honours paper, which in Australia is like a, it's a mini research project that can lead you into honours or uh, sorry, into Masters or PhD. And out of my honours project, I decided to apply for Museums in the Web. Again, something that I'd found out about because of Seb's blog. <laughs> and I rocked up to the other side of the world. Um, I, it got accepted, which wasn't really part of the plan. I just wanted to apply and get into practice of doing that. So when I arrived on the other side of the world, I'd never met another museum technologist. I'd never been to a conference. This was a brand new world for me. Um, but then I met, say, people like Coven, who'd just done his What's the Point of Museum websites talk, and he had a blog post, and I met Jasper Visser, and he had a blog post. And I was like, huh, this is the thing everyone in this sector does. And although I'm now doing my PhD, and I work a day a week at the same little art gallery, and I volunteer at the powerhouse, I, I had no other skin in the game. So I'd flown to the other side of the world, and met these amazing people. I'd met my tribe, and I had no skin in the game. So I was like, well, everyone's blogging. I guess maybe this is going to be the thing I do. So while everyone maybe had some context that what they were doing, they knew where it fit, I just, I really just started it to see what happened and as a way to join a conversation. And I think that's maybe why my approach has been maybe more cowboy than some. It's been a little kamikaze at times because I didn't really imagine that anyone would be paying attention. Um, Surprise! Yeah, <laughs> yes, very much so. So, um, Ed talked about actually keeping his two personalities or his personas separate. I think my blog persona has defined my professional persona. Mm -hmm. I think there's a really significant <clears throat> thing about not having a real institutional affiliation because it also means that I just see the things that I'm thinking about rather than thinking, oh, how, how's those guys at work going to feel about this? Um, and that can at times be problematic um, because I do get myself in trouble and I have, um, it was only really recently, I was at a conference in Australia and I wrote a blog post at the conference, really intending it for this audience, the people who I know and who are, very different and it um it was not intentionally critical in a in a negative way it was just saying oh, it's a different sort of conference format I'm used to quite a you know discussion and, and quite an open one and it, it went quite viral at the conference and I found myself very visible and it was this horrible moment of having insulted everyone in the room without really intending to and it was probably 
the moment I, A, wanted to erase my entire social media presence. I wanted to close the blog. I actually never wanted to leave the house. My husband and I almost bought a house that weekend purely because I was having a very, I, I must never leave home again <coughs> moment. Um, so uh, that sort of personal cost, because the only thing I, I don't even actually have a career yet. I have a potential career. So the only thing I've got to play with is what I'm working with. Um, so a lot of the time I feel like blogging is going to put me out of a job. Having said that, it's opened up incredible opportunities. The only reason I'm sitting here, the only reason I get to go to conferences, the only reason I get to talk to amazing people around the world is because of the blog. It's become my, my bargaining chip. I get to... The, I, I, have had some amazing guest bloggers, and it often happens that I just go, hey, you're someone who's doing really interesting stuff. I'm gonna get you to talk about it. And people will, because there's a forum, and you have this legitimate way of contacting people. Um, so, I, I really agree with Ed when he says that blogging is terrifying, um, because most of my initial readers were from the States, because that was the people I knew. I would have a habit, and I still do, of posting really late at night. And so writing something that you think might be a little provocative or controversial and you're not sure how people are going to respond and then hitting post just before you go to bed is a really, really awful idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have been known, because I sleep, I use my phone as my alarm, I have been known many, many times of waking up at 3 a.m. and logging <coughs> into my phone just in case there's been a post or just to see what people have responded to because I get so scared by that. Um, and yet, it's a thrill. I mean, it's amazing to have the conversations. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much gonna finish around there, but I think there's some really interesting things and I'd like to get into them in the conversation is about what it means when someone like me, who is new to the field, who is emerging, who just happens to be noisy, can get attention when it's not necessarily deserved. It's not necessarily that my ideas are the better ideas. I'm just loud about them. And I think that's a real problem. There's also a freedom that comes of being new to the field because you can ask stupid questions. But I, I think it's problematic that people pay attention to what I'm doing when I'm still just learning my way through the field. Um, so I, it, it's quite interesting sort of being in this space and with people who have experience as opposed to who are just making it up as they go along. Um, although I think in the blogging sphere, we're all doing that. Um, we all have experience making it up as we go along. Right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, 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 that's something I'd like to get into is what, what that sort of thing means. But I'm going to hand it over here at the moment. Good morning. Oh, we have, do we have a speaker all of a sudden? Sounds like it. Um, You're just naturally I'm resident. Just, I'm, just, I'm, I'm at the resident frequency of this room. Um, the, uh, I'm Eric Siegel. I'm the director and chief content officer at the New York Hall of Science, um, which means that, um, like all of us, I have a boss who's the CEO. And um, I, this, this conversation has already raised a bunch of questions for me that I'd like to um, start in with. Uh, when I was at... Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, at the Museums in the Web conference. Sure. Um, uh, a while back, I was uh, listening to some talks about how, um, how to implement a social media strategy and how to do blogging so that it supports the mission of the organization. And I was sitting there writing in my blog, as, as was happening, that the, really the most important thing about blogging and a social media strategy is the authenticity of the blogger's voice, and that to talk about a corporate social media strategy was sort of uh, a contradiction in terms. And so I was sitting there feeling kind of smart, and I posted it, and almost simultaneously I got an email from my CEO saying, listen, that blog post you made the other day um, about, um, I was saying that the park in which we're located is usually pretty dreary, um, because no money's invested there, you know, isn't helpful. So would you think of recasting it? Um, <laughs> you know, of course, I responded, no, no way. Um, and uh, I'm sorry. I should say that uh, anybody who's tweeting this, um, <laughs> too late. <laughs> Please don't. Um, uh, uh, and 
it actually, it actually, it, it led me to thinking a lot about um, about where I am and where we are in terms of in terms of blogging. But one of the things I was thinking just in the course of this conversation, and that's the gist of what I'm going to talk about, is you know how many of us are on listservs, right? I've been on listserv since 1979, right, when there were BBSs and CompuServe and all that stuff. And I love listservs, man. I just love listservs. I love the arguments that flare up. I love the, the uh, you know, the flame wars. I love the, um, I love the uh, sense of, of community. There's a, there's a woman who wrote <coughs> something called, uh, she, her name is Stacy Horn, and she wrote something called Cyberville back in the 90s. She, she founded Panics, which was the East Coast version of The Well. And she said something about, it was, Cyberville is about building community online mm-hmm. and uh, through listservs. And she had uh, several rules, one of which I thought was really telling, uh, which is that in order to keep a listserv healthy, people have to meet face-to-face once or twice a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I like these conferences, right? So these are your community. I'm not sure why people like uh, blogs more than they like listservs. I'm not sure why listservs have gone away and blogs have replaced them. You know, blogs are about me and hopefully you'll respond. Mm-hmm. Listservs are much more democratic. Um, you, and one of the great things about listservs is when one person starts to to, to make himself uh, more important than he deserves to be, you know, 75 other people stand up and said, you know, who died and made you God. And so, um, and they have an acronym for it, you know, W-D-A-M. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I, I, blogs made, made, you know, they're just sort of the latest thing. Um, I think online uh, communication, uh, I'm not sure it's, the, I'm actually, I'm not sure it's the best thing. Um, uh, it, 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 it proposes a hierarchy of, of opinion with the expert um, being the <coughs> pardon me, I have allergies being the proposer um, and then people responding and the, uh, the upshot of that is a lot of times people don't respond right, so the expert proposes and, and um, you know maybe they'll hit one or two topics that are pretty hot and, and then, you know, as you suggest there's, a, there's a, a really strange curve of, you know, these are my hot topics and then the rest nobody responds to so all that said, um, you know, I've been involved with blogging. Uh, I've been doing it for the past uh, couple of years in different formats. Um, another uh, sort of come back and bite me on the behind um, story is uh, Nina um, and I were talking. She wanted to, before she went to run the Santa Cruz Museum, she wanted to open a, um, I never understood this, a Belgian, frites, a Belgian <coughs> beer and frites place. Like, what? Who cares about Belgian beer and fruit? But anyway, she was really excited about it. And she was thinking, how can I become a 501c3? I said, you know, don't become a 501c3. This is a business. And I said, you know, 501c3s, they tend to be really burdened with a lot of overhead. And in general, you know, they suppress real innovation. I think that was what I thought at the time. And then she went on to, to editorialize after that, saying, you know, as a result, museums are conservative. They never innovate. Um, and somebody picked that up, saying, Eric Siegel says museums, yeah, director of New York Hall of Science, director of the New York Hall of Science, say museums are conservative, we never innovate. So, you know, of course, my boss has, and my, all my staff has, uh, has Google uh, News set up for New York Hall of Science, and I get, about, I get about six emails saying, you know, who, how can you say this about museums, Eric? So I wrote to Nina saying, you know, blah, blah, blah. and it's never going to go away, and there it is, and everybody's fine with it. But um, so I'll go back and look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about this coffee. Um, the New York Hall of Science has a strategy of, which I think is actually really um, clever strategy, really thoughtful uh, and potentially a powerful strategy of encouraging staff to blog within a kind of ecology of blogs that are sort of nice, I branded. And, um, you know, I, I was one of the first to take them up. On, actually, the first people to take them up, on, they, they, I say them, the, the Marketing External Relations Office who manages our website, the first to take them up on it was uh, our explainers. And our explainers, we have 100, 150 uh, high school and college kids who are employed by the whole, they're part of the staff of the whole of science. Um, and they sort of the public face of the institution as far as, uh, as, far as the exhibit floor and de- demonstrations and all the stuff that, you know, people are familiar with in science centers. Uh, our, our program is very lively and active, and it's paid so that people are more engaged. And we have um, this website. There's, there's something explainers do called clumping, which, uh, which means there are 150 visitors on the floor, uh, and there are three explainers, and they're all talking to each other, right? So we call that clumping. And um, so their website's called Clumpology. And um, you know, which, as far as I can tell, is 
means how to ignore visitors and talk to each other. But uh, <laughs> anyway, they, um, they, and and this has been a really great forum for them to talk among themselves. Uh, but they aren't talking among themselves, right? So they're talking with some kind of broader representative public. So we actually put clumpology behind a password um, to, to preserve that sense of talking among itself. But it gave r rise to a whole um, uh, kind of self-generated effort, which we call Explainer TV, which was rather than writing stuff, they started videotaping stuff and sharing that. And so over the course of the past two years, we started to watch how the explainers have been using media in the context of, mm. and I, I should say, uh, blogs are like for us, you know, with the average age in here, something. And, uh, you know, YouTube is definitely more powerful for, you know, if I want to know how to change a tire, you know, I, I go on YouTube, I don't look it up in the manual. And my kids are totally that way, too. They, they, they send stuff around on, on YouTube, though they also blog. Um, and so they, they started a, a media program uh, called Explainer TV, which is now part of the blog and now has extended. Um, so there's a huge amount of energy that was harvested from the staff, and I guess that's really my main point. Um, the staff has really become energized uh, to com communicate uh, what they have to say about the institution from their perspective. So I have um, all, every exhibition that I've been, I'm working on right now that's anywhere close to uh, being public it has a blog, uh, and we use that blog to share progress reports um, with my colleagues in the field, with, um, with the artists uh, that we're working with, with the designers we're working with. Um, and sometimes before it's ready for prime time, we put it behind a password. As it starts to become ready for prime time, um, we, we put it out into the community. These are really not uh, getting many comments. Um, these really are uh, tools for us to communicate to, as I think Ed said, you know, really, really well, for us to do something more than just casually talk to each other and, and spend some time making our thoughts coherent enough that they, uh, that they work in a written statement. And as a result, I think the level of communication that happens in those blogs between the designers and the staff and all the you know, evaluators and everything else um, ends up by being pretty powerful. So blog, in that context, blogs become sort of an internal communication tool, though they're open to the public. The intention is not really that they, um, that would be the first form. So when I write to somebody and say, uh, if I put on Facebook, for example, I'm working on this exhibition, we just hit just and so milestone, here's the blog you can go to. And typically we have, um, we keep the brand, we keep the nice eye brand in there, so it's a Tumblr or a, a WordPress blog, and the way we brand it is the name of the exhibition, nyside.org. So if you want to see regeneration. Nice, this is the exhibition we just opened. Nyside.org. You'll see, you know, a really rich resource of um, of both artists' work and and blogging by the artists and by us. Um, and that I, th I think that's you know that's a it's a clever strategy on our part um, in that it encourages new and and, and then with the the marketing office does, which I think is really smart, is they take specific blog posts and they'll put that onto the main website. So that if there's something really interesting that one of these staff people is saying, they will clip that and put it onto the main website. Um, so I, you know, I think it's, um, it's, it's a reason to do blogging that's more, you know, if you want to communicate with your peers, I really don't understand why, how a blog is superior to a listserv. Um, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm open to. I mean, maybe that's a point of discussion here, but I, I, I'm missing that. Um, I, you know, it's I. I have um, the museum L listserv. You know, has a lot of stuff that I'm not interested in, and actually, I, now I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I digest it, which is the you know the first step to not participating at all. Um, so maybe that what happens. The reason that people don't like listserv so much is it's more demanding on you, right? So you got to plow through stuff, find stuff you're interested in. But that's democracy, you know? I mean, uh, that's, that's, that's if, if the hope is to engage in dialogue or polylogue, um, then I think that you have to deal with that as part, you know, there's going to be a lot of stuff you're not interested in. And certainly one of the skills of, be, of having an online presence in general is filtering out stuff you're not interested in. Uh, so again, I'm not sure, and I'd be open to hearing why people think blogs are, are sort of better for what we're talking about than, than listservs. Um, as far as a corporate policy, we're, I'm probably to, we're representing the most sort of corporate, evolved corporate approach to, um, and by corporate, you know, I mean the Oracle of Science, they take that with a grain of salt. Um, <laughs> uh, the, um, I think that the opportunity to engage staff at all different levels, and there really isn't like, there's not a gate, you know, it's like, if you say to the, the PR people, the marketing people, you know, I really would like to have a blog, they'll set it up for you. So, 
Um, it can be an educator who's working on a specific project. It can be, you know, I'm fairly senior. Um, it can be people at various, our librarian has a blog. Um, so it can be point people at different levels of hierarchies. And I really like the way that enriches uh, the online presence of the, of the institution. Mm. Um, and I think when people come to the website, they get a glimpse of those things and they can dig deeper. Now, I don't think very many people do. I, I, unfortunately, I didn't look at our web stats. Oh, on our blogs before I came here to talk. But, you know, they're not big. Um, they're not huge numbers we're talking about. Most people come to our website to just get visitor information. Um, but I think over time, we'll see that that may... It, it's a, I, I just think it's a really plausible strategy if the, if the uh, administration is comfortable with the idea of, of uh, that, they, that they're, they trust their staff sufficiently not to do stupid stuff like I did at the beginning, you know, um, and to be responsible about the way they describe their work. You know, we haven't had, other than me, uh, we haven't had anybody say anything that I've seen on any of the blogs that is, um, you know, that, that raises any hackles anywhere. So I think the, you know, the moral of the story is trust the staff, harvest their voices, and, um, and recruit them into creating a more dimensional story about what your museum is like. Mm. And my, the mic did go on. It's not just me. Well, I think we got a speaker about halfway through. Uh, that would happen. <laughs> All right. All right. So there's the talking at you portion. Do you want to? Do you want to be the? Yeah, uh... I'll kick it. All right. All right. Yeah. Hey. Oh, we do have. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I wonder, uh, we've actually got a lot of good questions coming in here, and we'll try and get to most of them. But I wonder if, if we might start a little bit first by talking about, and this is a little bit uh, part of the listservs versus blogs versus sort of a, a, a printed publication versus blogs, in the sense that, you know, when you're dealing with a, a listserv or something like Curator, where you know really the size of the audience that you're writing for, you kind of know that it's a, a basically a unlimited output, versus, say, a blog post where you can say, Thank okay... You. I'm writing this, and three people might read it, or it might take off, and three million people might read it. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you might actually talk about that in the context of, because most of, uh, all four of you, to varying degrees, your blogs represent sort of evolving thought and evolving practice, and sort of the difficulties where when you have that post that takes off and three million people read it, and you're like, three weeks later, you're like, well, actually, I changed my mind. Like, my thoughts evolved from there. Mm. I wonder if you might sort of talk about the difficulties there and sort of how, how you've dealt with that and mitigate that and your sort of different approaches to writing. So there's about eight questions in there, but yeah. <laughs> Go Suze. <laughs> um, okay, there's a really nice, there's a long piece um, on the Atlantic website from a long established blogger, more, more a news blogger, um, called Why I Blog. And he makes an observation that says um, blogging is more like a broadcast <laughs> um, and it, it sort of if it stops swimming, it, it, it sinks. So it's this idea of constant motion. And that's how I've always thought about it. I've always thought of my blog as ideas and thought, and it's quite almost transitional. And it's only really recently that I've realised that other people don't necessarily see mm. it that way. Other people treat it as if these are my well-held views and that this is that this is a statement, not a provocation, or that this is an end point, not a transition. And I actually don't know how I'm gonna deal with that in the longer term. I, I actually don't know that I can or want to change my approach, because one of the things that I like about blogging and that I find quite addictive about it is that it is this opportunity to respond to things and to play around with ideas, and there's a sense of, well, I'm just gonna work with this and see what happens. Um, but I don't know what it's going to mean in five years' time when my ideas on something have really changed and people just go back and refer to what's there in the public record. And that's always been the case. Things have always existed in the public record. If you're a journalist, things have been there, but people don't necessarily go back and look up your newspaper articles, but they can stumble upon your blog and think that what you said five years ago is what you <coughs> still find because they might not date check it. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. I don't think I've resolved it. I actually don't think I know how I feel about it and also what it will mean longer term. I think one of these things of actually growing up professionally in public is trying to come to terms with, with 
the implications of that. And when it does come time for me actually finding a job, how I'm going to find someone as an employer who is quite willing for me to keep doing what I do mm. is going to be a really interesting challenge because I don't want to give that up, but I, I'm finding it a really interesting space to be working in. How I find an institution that is fine for me to keep poking at the institution and the sector and let that be okay, I, I don't know how I'll do. I think, I, would, I think so much of the work that we do, probably 99% of the work that, that museum educators do, but I think this is probably true for any, curators, anyone across the field, is process, and about 1% of your work is product. <clears throat> but unfortunately, it's only that 1% that gets published or that we feel comfortable talking about. <clears throat> and I've had this conversation with educators where they only want to talk about the iPad app they've developed after they've done the formative evaluation process for three years and they've got it ready for curator or they've got it ready and then they can blog about it because it's done but the 99% they don't want to talk about um, except for when we're on the phone oh my god I've got so I think I'd love to think about the way that these um, bazaars I'm going to stick with that the way that the, the sort of online bazaar of talking about these things can actually change the way we think about the work we do and put more emphasis on what we're doing which is process based work and take some of the emphasis on the polished fancy thing that comes out at the end that may fail anyway um, so if we focus more on the process I think it may change the expectations people have when they read about online publishing and maybe even when they get to the print publishing uh, changing the way that we're presenting the work that we're in process of doing. What else do I possibly have to add? Um, <laughs> you don't need to feel you can't, you know? <laughs> Well, there is, there is one thing, though, uh, that I want to build a little bit on what Mike said about uh, the process versus the product. So when I, when I first started um, thinking, okay, if I'm going to do this thing out in public, the, the, the model that I had in my mind was specifically that blogging is a place to ask questions as opposed to make statements. And yes. coming at it that way from the outset, I think, um, has really defined what, what I wind up blogging about because as someone who, you know, I came up doing exhibitions, it's, I, I write exhibit labels, it's the thing that winds up defining me is such a minuscule proportion of the amount of what I actually do every day. Um, having, having a place to be able to live in the process and, and ask the questions about what it is we're doing and, and why um, was really the thing that, that made blogging stick with me. Um, that, that, I think, is its defining characteristic as far as I'm concerned. So, um, I mean, I, 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 can, I can remember thinking, okay, I'm going to do this blog thing. I need to write a disclaimer in case I get in trouble. And that was the first thing that came to mind was, you know, anything I say here, I may very well change my mind, and that's just the way it should be. So take it all with a grain of salt. A um, couple of things. First of all, um, I didn't mention the name of the blog that I keep personally, which is theworks.nyside.org. Uh, and I haven't been posting much. And the reason I haven't been posting much is I've been really passionately involved with an exhibit program that's raised a lot of um, emotions. It's been a really uh, difficult, uh, fraught exhibit process. And I haven't felt that um, I should write anything down until I could do a emotion recollected in tranquility, uh, do a Wordsworth number on that. Um, but uh, so you know, go over and have a look. There's nothing current right now, but there will be. Um, Again, this whole question of, you know, so if, if, you know, what are the questions like on the listserv, right? Um, the questions on the museum listserv, you know, I need to preserve such and so, you know, how do I do this? Um, the questions on the Aztec listserv, you know, um, what, are the, what are some good examples of online, um, online professional development, or, you know, whatever it is. Those are questions that people want answered, right? Those are questions that they're putting out there because they want them answered. There's a different quality of the questions that come out, um, and I do the same thing. I think it's a, it's a good... It's a good um, way of defining why you blog, you know, how, how to avoid the trouble of sort of asserting things. But they're, they're sort of a different kind of question. They're sort of the, um, you know, the big questions. Uh, um, and and they're sort of the questions that are put out there without expecting an answer, you know. They're, they're, they're the questions that where you say, saying, don't we all share in these questions? And, and, and aren't they things that we should be thinking about as a field? So it's kind of a different dynamic. Um, I, I, I tend to um, do what... Um, what my uh, 
with Margaret, my CEO, called problematize things, right? So I tend to think of things. Um, I, <laughs> I think, I think she, she, she's an academic, so I think it's actually a good thing. Um, I, I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not sure if she's sure either. Uh, and, but that means I'm more interested in, th- in the problems than I am in the, in the solutions. And when I show funders around, I always talk about the things that were hard for us to do as opposed to saying, look, we slam, this is a slam dunk. And I find that they're really engaged with that. And I find colleagues are really engaged with things that, that are shared problems. Um, what are the things that are difficult for us to do? Uh, so um, I, I definitely am drawn to posting about those in the blogs, and those are the, it's hard. You have to stop and really think about how you want to express this. Um, and what I found is I, uh, whenever I pose a problem, I don't get an answer um, uh, or much of even much of a dialogue on the blog. People might say, yeah, really interesting question, but there's not really a give and take. So uh, and that, to that extent, you know, the way blogs are structured is, you know, here I am, and tell me what you think. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's, it could be different. So. Can I just ask you in this room blogs, if anyone does? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Figure it. <laughs> Love it. We should have, like, a list. What do you guys, what do you guys find? Yeah? This isn't directed at anyone in particular, um, but I've noticed not just true very, very pronounced here. I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to be Phil Donahue for a second. <coughs> if you say something really awesome, I want it to be <laughs> And even if not. Um, <laughs> yeah, no pressure. <laughs> We're terrified of being wrong in public. Like, mortally terrified. And a big part of that, I think, has to do with the way the whole profession is structured. It doesn't lend itself to being wrong in public at all. So this is not so much about blogs, but in general, that's really bad. Mm. Like, you're allowed to be wrong. I don't know about anyone, but I didn't spring fully formed. Um, So I guess the thing with, you know, I've been blogging since 99. Like, I've been, it's probably on the Wayback Machine somewhere. Just search for Ben Brown, 3,000 words. This conversation has been going on since the year 2000. People have been trying to figure out what it means. Uh, On some level, it's just the ability to participate. It is the ability to route around what is otherwise gated access. Mm -hmm. I think it's more than the ability to participate, though. Is this, is this thing on? Yeah, oh, yeah, here we go. Um, we can have a walking mic and a sitting mic. Um, I think one of the things that both concerns me but that is also really intoxicating about blogging is it's not just participating. It's a chance to shape the conversation. I mean, if Ed writes something and I respond to it and a bunch of people tweet about it and then um, Seb posts something and he reflects back, the conversation changes. Like, it's not even just a, hey, we're responding to what's happening. It's actually a chance to define what people talk about, which is, I think, why I get really concerned about the power-to-weight ratio of thought, um, as in it's not necessarily the most powerful thoughts or the, the most important thoughts that sometimes have the power. It's the medium. So, yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that I find really interesting in blogging in the museum conversation, because I agree. I think... People are very um, safe professionally because you do have institutions and you do have jobs writing on these things that people say. Um, so it's sort of a... But why, yeah. why is that? I mean, you have relationships that are writing on too. I mean, that's the thing. I'm not going to diss this curator that I'm working with right now. You know, it's not going to do it. It's, um, it's, not, it's not fair to him, you know, just because I'm not, a, not happy right now. Um, you know, I'm not... Uh, this generic curator that I'm working with that I start again you know it, it, they're relationships it's a, it's a, it's a f- and and I I really I, I don't agree that we don't like to be wrong any more than other fields I think that um, again my, my colleagues and I talk about the stuff that's different I'm not sure if we even know what it means to be wrong frankly but um, you know we know that we're experimenting is the way I would put it and that not all experiments work. So, I, and I think it's a field that's very has an appetite for experiments. So, I think that's a great thing to share with people, and that's what I hope to be able to get back to sharing on the on the blog. Yeah. Well, 
Well, Eric, that's, I mean, it's interesting because I think, um, I think individually we're okay with being wrong, but I think often the way that manifests itself at an institutional level is very different, mm. you know? And so I, I was actually harkening back to Sarah posted early about a, a smackdown that she received from her institution in 2001 for posting something. She didn't tell us what it was. That's a long time. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> thinking... Okay. But um, thinking about how oftentimes that sort of institutional thin skin manifests itself in that way, you know, where it's like, w when I think about it, you know, like the phrase blogging policy yeah. just seems so horribly wrong. <laughs> Social you, media I mean, policy, you, you know, Yeah, but, but I mean, they exist, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and, and I mean, whether they should or not is a whole other conversation. Actually, no, it's not. They shouldn't exist. But, um, but especially when you start to take that to the next level, when we start thinking about, uh, as you're saying, and actually, Sue's your question, is like for me, I think about when we are hiring, I'll finish the sentence here, I promise. Um, <laughs> you know, for museums to be where they need to be, like when we're, until on a curator's job application, it says, send us your resume and a link to your blog. Like, we're, until we start expecting that from people. But once we do start expecting that, then what does that look like? Mm. You know, now that we're taking somebody's sort of what was a personal thing, what maybe started from the point of enthusiasm rather than from a sort of institutional or goal-oriented point of view, and now you're saying that's actually part of your professional and institutional profile. Mm. So, well, because um, I, I think it's interesting this dynamic between the, the professional career that you have and this online thing that you do. Um, I remember reading Nina Simon post about writing about this, and I can't remember if it was on her blog or just in a conversation with her. She said that basically one of the things she, you know, accounts for her, you know, rise from intern at the International Spy Museum, volunteering at the Museum her, of Science first, yeah, or at the Museum of Science first, um, all the way to director of a museum, is that she did Museum 2.0. And it launched into a book, and it kept spreading, and you know it's become a, a sort of uh, potentially a paradigm shifter in terms of thinking about museums. <clears throat> um, so it can, you know, build someone's career potentially. Um, I think when I was hired at the Portland Art Museum recently, there was an element of well, at least you know who I am because I've got a couple <clears throat> dozen posts about my thinking about museum education, and that kind of a colleague told me that it, you know helped brand my professional identity. That I never even thought about it that way. Um, on the flip side, there's a contributing author on the site right now who he or she is applying for jobs. And one of her potential employers said, His don't her. do that. Her. Oh, her. Well, they're mostly her. So. <laughs> That's not going to narrow it down. There's 12 hers on the site. All right. um, potential employer said, don't write on the blog stop doing that and we'd like that's going to be a big problem as you're out there on the job market so she called me and said what do I do do you take down all my posts do I stop doing this and I said you do what you want to do but here's my thought you don't want to work for someone that doesn't like to hear what you have to say um, and I think that's how I've always approached it is I don't really like I don't really want to say something that's going to piss off my employers mm -hmm. because it's not productive for me right. anyway. Um, but if I have something that I'm really passionate about and I do want to say it, I'm going to say it here, I'm going to say it on the blog, and I'm going to go to my boss's office or coworkers' offices and say it there too. Um, and so it was kind of a moment for her to say, I do want to work somewhere that says, I loved that post you wrote back in 2011 or 2012, and you know we really like that. You've created this identity that's passionate about what you do. Um, so it was interesting for her to sort of change her thought around, you know, what that means for her career. That when she writes these things, people are listening, including people that could hire her down the road. So, but uh, so that, it can get really tricky. But well, actually, and that's interesting. I think that brings up a, a bigger issue that I'd like to talk about, um, which is that sort of individual brand identity. I mean, what that's which is really what we're talking about here, ultimately, and particularly in, in Susie's case, I would say. So, I wonder if you might address that a little bit. Just just talk about kind of what that means for you, or or whether that even resonates at all. Um, yeah, it totally resonates. This is, so when I did used to work with rock and roll bands, um, I'm. I'm interested in hype. I'm interested in how indie bands get from being nothing to getting a whole bunch of people knowing exactly who they are and 
getting on radio and getting all the good gigs and then they go away and record their debut album and I kind of turned that model, which is what I used to work with with bands, to my blog. So while the blog was, I, I entered into it quite naively, I, I know how to do hype. I don't have a problem with the fact that I write provocative things. They're the things I'm thinking about, but yeah, it also does get people talking, which is really fun. And okay, this is getting into rock and roll strategy, but you sort of want to be everywhere for a short period of time. You need to appear on the scene and be everywhere. And so trying to go to conferences and be on Twitter and no one have ever heard of me until suddenly I'm appearing in a whole bunch of places has been a really good strategy in terms of <coughs> being able to then get into more places. It's the virtuous circle of success is you suddenly show up everywhere and people think that, hey, that person, I keep hearing of this person, so clearly they must be doing something interesting. I'll have to, you know get them to come to my party. Um, so, I would, yeah, the personal brand thing, on one hand, is kind of terrifying because I don't know what my brand is. Um, although, no one had ever used the word provocative with my name until about two years ago, and now it seems to keep happening, so I think that's apparently part of my brand, um, if there is a brand. But I certainly did try and turn what I did with rock and roll to blogging and to my career, so I don't know where it goes, but I'm having a whole lot of fun having play along the way. Hmm. Apparently it's you. <laughs> 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 um, the, the, you know, the reason Nina, people know, know about Nina is, I mean, the reason they know about her is her blog, but the reason that she's, she's doing what she's doing is because she's good, um, and she's smart. And I haven't read Museum Geek. I will now. Um, but my impression is, you know, people people get to be known. There, how many blogs are there out there? I mean, geez. Um, and you know, people get to be known because they have something uh, useful to say. And so, you know, as in most things, quality tends to out. Um, it tends to it tends to be the thing that people pay attention to over time. Um, and you know, I know Ed's work, and and I and I, and I follow his blog, and I know Paul Arcelli, and I know you know there's people I know that I know have really uh, informed things to say, and even if they're not experienced, they have provoc you know they're thoughtful things to say. Nina wasn't all that experienced; she just asked good questions. Right. And um, so you know, <laughs> what I would encourage people who are going to be participating <clears throat> online to do is be good. Um, be really good at what you're doing. Take the time. Don't be casual about it. Um, you know, and and the, and I think I I actually don't have a problem. I, I'm the senior admin person here, um, and I'm the senior administrator here, and I don't have a problem with an institutional policy. Actually, I think I did at one point, but I've I've thought about it a lot, and I think people value a framework in which they know they're expected to work. Um, they value knowing where the limits are on, on what they're expected to say in an, in, in an institutional blog. Um, and if they want to participate, they participate with those, with those rules in mind. You don't want it to be constraining. You want to be generous. You want it to be an authentic voice. But you know, I, there is no form in which you can go and say, well, that's not true. There's lots of forms in which you can go say exactly what you want in the comments on YouTube. Um, but a good forum, a forum that provides for quality thinking and quality writing, um, is valuable for people, and a lot of times that involves constraints. So, you know, write well, use good pictures, um, you know, and, 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 be, and, be, and don't ramble. You know, all those things, all those things that are good, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> um, questions? Does somebody want to die you that mic? Yes. That's a new verb. Yeah. Like don't bogart that. You know. Thank you. Don't donahue that mic. I think that um, blogging is much more about storytelling than uh, websites, and that museums have been realizing so for a while now, and that's the reason why we keep blogging and blogging. I mean, the website is perfect for uh, official communication, the neutral tone, tone of voice, but to get a much more personal approach and to give uh, room for multiple voices, then the blog is the thing. And uh, I had been blogging for several years at the Picasso Museum. I was the, the blog editor. And the posts that were most successful were those about processes, always, much more than when we talked about results. About results, you can talk on your website. Mm. But 
processes, uh, the successes, the failures, the, all, all the things involved uh, really attracted much interest uh, to, to our audience. The only thing we didn't uh, succeed much was in getting comments. <laughs> we could uh, receive maybe 10,000 uh, reads of a, of a given post, but just a few comments, maybe just three or four comments, and that was a little bit frustrating. And as much as we tried and we ended the post with uh, open <coughs> questions, and we, we, we really didn't succeed on that. And now I work at the National Museum of Art in Barcelona, and uh, there isn't a block yet, but we are on our way to open a new one. And um, I, I will replicate that model of talk, uh, talking about processes and, and, for example, showing when, we, when you choose a given cover for a catalog, then you show the discarded options, and you ask the audience, if they have, they would have chosen the same or or not, and why, and and those things uh, are really, I think, engaging for the for the audience. Thank you. Um, I think the thing that brought me into blogging, I've been blogging for about three years. Um, my name is Adrian Russell. Nice to meet you. Um, my blog's called Cabinet of Curiosities, and one of the things that I thought about when I started was the issue of authority. I was in one of those high responsibility, low authority kind of jobs <laughs> where I had a lot of responsibility for things but absolutely no voice in my institution. So I started my blog so that I would have a voice. So that's kind of where I started. I thought, well, all these things I want to talk about and no one really cares that I have these questions and if I ask them, no one really has the time to answer them. So let me put them out into the community and see what comes back. So it really kind of started off partly diary, but partly giving a voice to the people who might be at that you know, low level of their career and have no forum to discuss anything. So now I do feel like it's a brand, because I just got a new job, and the first thing they said to me when I sat down was, so tell us about your blog. I was like, <laughs> holy crap, <laughs> is that a good thing or a bad thing? But then when I started talking to them, they said, oh, it's a wonderful thing. So it can definitely have an impact for you. Um, as you move forward in your career. And it's nice to have a body of written work. I mean, if you're going to get into writing for museums or do any kind of editing or publication, you can point to it and say, yes, I can string a sentence together. Here, proof, proof right here that I can write. Where are you working now? I'm working at the Beach Museum of Art, which is a university museum at Kansas State University. So it's a small regional museum, it's about eight staff. And I was formerly the Nelson Atkins in Kansas City, so it's just a nice- it's a whole different thing. Yeah. Whole different world. Yeah. <laughs> How, how many people in here are blo have blogs or blog or something? Because mm -hmm. I have to blog about this. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you guys find? I mean, what are the interesting issues for you guys? Um, I'm in a really oh, big oh, agency. Oh, Come on, Phil. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm in a really big agency, um, basically making blog announcements about a, a very tiny project. And I was curious if anybody has any um, ideas on, on how to get the word out. We have an intra intranet, and so this is not an open forum for outsiders, but I'm sort of posting progress reports on this project I'm doing. I'm the only one doing it in the agency. What's your, what, what agency? Uh, National Archives. Uh -huh. And it's a project within the archives that yes. you're trying to get communicated Yes, I'm trying to, the rest to get other archives. people interested. I'm trying to get people to participate. I'm trying to get them to What's do the, the project? I'm working with Wikipedia and Wikimedia. And we so just it's lost our crowdsourcing. It's a crowdsourcing kind of project? Yes, and we just lost our Wiki, Wikipedian in residence, so I'm kind of announcing what we're doing. Um, and I put something up every week, every other week. We've been hitting all these benchmarks. It's a very exciting project, but I'm curious to know if anybody has any. Um, um, advice on how to engage. Because Try to get the more popular, more widely known bloggers to, you know, to, 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 to like now that you've mentioned this here, maybe somebody here would be interested in talking to you about, you know, and then so you then you really have a link from your uh, from their blog to yours, and they can just link to your blog anyway. So you know, find the places that people who are. I'm not sure we can go external. Oh, external. Yeah, it's, right, it's right, right, all sorry. very internal. Right. So my readership is only employees. Right, right, right. right, right. And so. Um, is it that people don't know about it, or that they do and they just don't want to get participating in it? I'm not sure. I, it's very new, so I know that we. I haven't built up a lot of momentum in terms of. I mean, I've been doing it for two months, so it's very early yeah. on. But I'm. Not, I, are there keywords I can be using in the title to draw people in? I mean, I really have no idea. <laughs> you don't want to know. 
Um, one thing I would say is talk to people in person. That's a nice one. Right? I, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask a question of a question, but why why did you decide not to make it external? I mean, maybe it's that's part of an internal network that we're um, supposed to use when communicating with our coworkers. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I would recommend that actually. Yeah, Yammer is nice. Um, you can use Google Plus for internal networks, which is nice. But Oh, that's right. You're the government. Oh, right. Um, they don't give us a whole lot. But, but I think the other thing is, I think, I think, you know, you should ask sort of what does success look like? Because it's not just am I connected with people, but it's, you know, like, it, what kind of engagement are you looking to get? Is it like, is it okay that you have really deep levels of engagement from two people, or are you just looking to have a whole bunch of people vaguely aware of the project? No, you know, because I think that that addresses would, would help you to address the the problem. You know. Hi, my name is Judy, and I'm a lurker. And and that was exactly the question I wanted to ask you, especially in the National Archives. Isn't it possible that the level of engagement for many of the people inside your institution is reading? And what your users love to do is read. And perhaps you don't have a good way, you only know click, if the only way you think you're getting engagement is for someone to write back to you, respond, no, I, I mean, do you I have ways to know? <laughs> uh, I'm so you do need more. I'm just gonna, while I'm talking with the microphone, I think one of the things that for me has been so um, exciting about blogging is that operating within a community. It off, it started with face-to-face, though. So actually talking to people about the blog and referring I'm them to... Feel that. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> the plot keeps thickening on this. <laughs> Show them. <laughs> Have lunch with them. Email them. At, like, it's, it's the personal connections. Like, my particularly at the start, my blog was people that I knew. It's now not, and that's a whole different ball game because I still think it's people that I know, and that's a really different space to be in because you don't know who you're reading uh, or who's reading you. But it's all community that gets the word out at the start. Thank you. All right, anybody have time for maybe one, one or two more? Yeah. All right, so. Great. Um, just because this has come up just now, and also maybe you could have like a Skype conversation and then encourage people to like talk online. <laughs> or have, have a conversation online like with faces. Anyways, what I was going to ask is, um, could you all talk a little bit more about strategy, listening to your audience, and metrics of success? How do you decide whether or not what you're doing is successful? I'll start with the mic. Um, yes. if, if my my thinking is advanced by what's going on, then that's really my only metric of success. So, um, you know, the questions that are of interest to me that I put out there and I wind up having a conversation with people, um, that is interesting, then that's really the only metric of success I, I care about. Um, I don't know how the rest of y'all feel about it. Do you know that? Yeah, I think um, I, um, I use the same metric for success that I do with gallery teaching because I'm a teacher in the galleries essentially. Um, I always tell docents that I'm training that you've known you've become the most successful gallery teacher when you can walk away and no one knows you've left. Um, because the conversation just keeps happening in front of the work of art and they don't know that there's center teachers left. So when I can step away from the blog and no one even knows that I'm gone, I will have succeeded in getting this awesome group conversation happening without me needing to even be there. So, Amen. All right, last question. Um, it was kind of, kind of a comment, really. It might help you a little bit as well. I mean, I've been blogging only for a year. Um, and I was completely content not to blog until I was just telling a little story to a friend at a, an event and they said, can you write that down because I want to cite it. Because mm. um, I was talking about a crowdsourcing thing I was doing on a remote Scottish island in you know, 2000. And they were going, okay, that's an early version of crowdsourcing. 
can you can you mention it? And I, and I went, okay, why do you think it's important? I didn't think it was important enough to write about. And they said, but if you write just a couple of paragraphs, then I can actually point to it and cite it, and I can't do that if you don't do that. You know, it's more difficult to do. So I started doing that, and then I kind of got interested in it. And you know, main, main barrier is is, is, is is time. But in terms of getting people to to read it, um, most of the time I don't do this strategy. Um, but on the one or two occasions where I've really wanted a lot of people to read something, uh, actually posting to a listserv gets an inc- you know four times the number of readers than not yeah. doing that <clears throat> and also identifying key people who are going to be your champions who will tell other people to read this thing and emailing them not just tweeting them or whatever actually emailing them something making a direct thing you know so on those occasions where most of the time I'm you know I'm 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 bumbling along at a few hundred people reading and those few times where I've thought look this is something I really want to be read a lot and I've put that effort in, then it's gone up to thousands. Um, so there's, there's that aspect of reaching specifically to people through email. It's, it's kind of strange to say, but it sort of sits with that list of things. When I, when I post to post my blog, it automatically, if my, my blog is built on Tumblr and it goes to Facebook, so people you know, know on my Facebook network know what's going on. I can't quite figure out what the hell's going on with LinkedIn, but when I do figure out what the hell's going on, I, uh, it's getting closer. Um, I suspect, you know, just, I was just looking at my LinkedIn map, and it's all business. You know, I, I intentionally made LinkedIn a business-oriented thing, so that would probably be a great way to do that, too. And, yeah, then I have 20 people on a list that, uh, on a on a email that says, you know, I did this blog post, and then I put on the eyes and the serve, and, uh, and yeah, then six people read I have one question to ask. Since we have a lot of people in here that have blogs, could you um, go onto Twitter and use the hashtag MCN2012 tail and just give us a link to your blog so that all of us can then go onto Twitter and find the 30 or 40 blogs that are in this room? Because I would love to, like I said, connect that community and visit them and follow them. Yeah, I'd love to do It's not just about us. It's really about you more than that. Um, If you want to write for my blog and you have anything to say about art museum teaching, let me know. I would love to hear your voice in that way too and uh, we're, we're out of time but if any yeah. of you have any other further questions we're going to be here for a few mo- more minutes so come on up and we'll continue the conversation thank you very much for coming thank you.